meeting. And uh, just a reminder that the session's being recorded for training and record keeping purposes, and that by participating in this session, you're consenting to the recording, retention, and use of this session. We have a really good agenda today. Um, about really pertinent topic, the outdoor recreation economy in Pennsylvania and some of the work that's been underway uh, over the last couple of years, culminating in a report uh, recently released on the next steps for the Office of Outdoor Recreation. Uh, and then, of course, we'll have our normal council reports. We'll hear from Secretary Dunn um, and our other business uh, before our presentations. Uh, before we move to public comment, just a couple of housekeeping uh, items for you. One is we're going to go around the room and do introductions in particular because we have some great people in the audience today who are key partners of Conrac, um, and I think it would be great to you know hear directly from them just briefly. But before we do that, I want to um, take a moment to recognize Gretchen Leslie, who has for uh, many years been the a liaison between Conrac and the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Conrac members know that uh, over the, like the last six months or so, we've been sort of phasing uh, or weaning, I would say, Gretchen off of Conrac and bringing Nicole on board um, and making that transition to where Nicole has been serving as our liaison. It's been a really productive process in that when we have our planning meetings, uh, Gretchen's been there with us to fill in our blanks and in institutional knowledge and how things have worked. Um, and so that's been a, a really good evolution and we're really pleased to have Nicole with us. But just wanted to take a moment to thank Gretchen uh, for how many years, Gretchen, of service to Conrad? 10 or 11 years, a decade, give or take. Um, and, and anybody that served on Conrack or has been engaged with DCNR knows how integral Gretchen has been to not just Conrack, but to DCNR's work in the community, its evolution over time. And so just wanted to take a moment to thank her and give the secretary an opportunity to say a few words as well. Okay. And well, I can't emphasize how, how much Gretchen has done uh, for our executive team, especially in the Conrack realm. Uh, when I came into the role, I, uh, you know, part of my history had been to serve on the old DER CAC, and I uh, understood the sacrifice and importance of that, that formality of that citizen voice in the core of uh, the agencies, to the core of the agency's leadership. And so um, I put my senior advisor in charge of it because uh, I wanted it to be core and central and and frankly, we had to really build it up and support it. And Gretchen's done a phenomenal job. And um, if anyone knows Gretchen uh, knows that she really likes chocolate. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the only way to possibly reward her at all would be uh, through chocolate. So this is uh, hearts because everyone loves Gretchen and chocolate because Gretchen loves chocolate. <laughs> you you can choose. That's you, all for you. You, you can choose to you. share it, Gretchen, but you you uh, is coming your way, and you can open it and share it, or you can hoard it. It's a, it's, it's your call. Let's let's hear it for uh, for Gretchen. Yeah. We've each prepared a five-minute speech honoring Gretchen. <laughs> right, we have a feeling Gretchen's not totally leaving us behind. <laughs> so thank you again, Gretchen, and thank you, Nicole, uh, for all the work that's to come. <laughs> um, so going around the room for introductions, I'll start. I'm Silas Chamberlain. I'm chair of Conrack in my day job. I'm chief strategy officer. Vice President of Economic Development at the York County Economic Alliance. I've been on Conrack now for maybe three years or so. Everybody knows Secretary Dunn. Yeah, so. uh, Dave Trimpey, I've been on uh, Conrack since March of 2014, about the time Gretchen started. So, uh, And I am also departing. I think this may be my last meeting as my term is up, and uh, I think there's a process going on for a replacement that hopefully will be coming before March. So I will miss everybody I've met over the years. It's been a wonderful experience, uh, particularly Secretary Don. I've, uh, her and I have developed a relationship. We knew each other previously, but it's it's been good. So again, thank you all and uh, good luck in the future. And I'll try to tune in once in a while and see what's going on. So. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Dave. Bob Kirshner, I'm from Elk County. I'm a uh, 
retired safety consultant and uh, still consult with the forest products industry and an avid snowmobiler. Also, Alan from Armstrong. Good afternoon, everyone. Matt Gobbler. I uh, have been a member of Conrack since uh, 2022. And for my day job, I am the executive director of the Pennsylvania Forest Products Association. Hello, I'm Meredith Graham from Washington County. I'm an environmental lawyer and family caregiver. Mm. Can you hear me? Yep. <laughs> My name is Jerry Walls. I'm a retired executive director of Lycoming County Planning, but uh, <clears throat> still actively involved with the Pennsylvania Wilds Planning Team and Susquehanna Greenway Partnership and American Planning Association, a legislative committee and other committees. So I, I'm from uh, the Williamsport, Pennsylvania area. Geraldine Umstead Singer. I used to work at DCNR many years ago <laughs> um, and some of my best times for sure. And now I'm a uh, caregiver and volunteer and worked with Gretchen when I was chair. And Gretchen, thank you so much for all that you've done. I agree. She's done an outstanding yeah. job. And Nicole, welcome. We're so glad to have you on board. And I am from Dolphin County. I'm Ephraim Zimmerman. I um, am the science director with the uh, Western Pennsylvania Conservancy's Heritage Program and um, I'm from Pittsburgh. Hi, good afternoon. Nicole Farraguna. I'm the policy director and now apparently the CONRAC advisor. Um, it is a pleasure. I, I know many of you have worked with you for a long time and so I'm looking forward to taking on this role. I can't thank Gretchen enough uh, for mentoring me and continuing to mentor me. Um, now that I know chocolate is part of that deal, I'll be happy to supply you um, and can't thank uh, Silas um, enough too. It's been just a pleasure to work with you. So thank you. And uh, moving to the audience, it, this is just happenstance, but Tom Gilbert happens to be in the front row and Tom just joined as president of the Pennsylvania Environmental Council. So Tom, would you mind just introducing yourself a little bit about your background? Oh yeah, yeah. Thank you. Great. Well, uh, nice, nice to meet everyone. I'm Tom Gilbert. I'm um, now seven days on the job as um, the new president of PAC, and I'm very excited to be here. And um, and I know Janet sits on this committee, and I don't know that she's logged in or not, but she's unwell, unfortunately, and spared everybody, uh, you know, her her germs today. But um, I'm very uh, anxious. I'm in I'm in sponge mode, as you might imagine, and just you know listening and learning. So I look forward to your uh, agenda today, and in particular, um, hearing from Nathan about the GORP and and the Office of Outdoor Recreation, which something that um, you know we're very excited about, and and uh, I, I understand advocated for. So please see all of that. Uh, happening. Um, I uh, have spent my career in the nonprofit uh, conservation world. Most recently, I come from the New Jersey Conservation Foundation, where I was co-executive director, um, Appalachian Mountain Club, Trust for Public Land. Um, so my background is very much, you know, conservation, natural resources. Um, I live in Bucks County. I've been there for about 30 years. Um, and uh, I know David leaves very big shoes to fill, and I will, I will do my best uh, to 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 fill them and and continue the great partnership uh, that I know um, has been long in place between PEC and, uh, and DCNR. So I think I'll leave it at that. Well, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we'll switch to Claire Jance, and I just give a preview of our, our upcoming March meeting, uh, where you'll hear a lot more from Claire talking about the C2P2 program. So this is just your formal, uh, semi-formal introduction to Claire. Yeah, thanks Silas. And um, and thanks to you all for the work that you do on the 
on Conrack. And um, like Tom, I'm in sponge mode. Um, I've been here about a month. So, um, so the, you know, slowly climbing up the learning curve here. Um, I, before coming to DCNR, I was at Shippensburg University um, as a geography professor. And I was also the director of the Center for Land Use and Sustainability. Um, and so I had the opportunity to get my hands. I was at SHIP for almost 19 years. Um, but I had my hands on a lot of different projects and many of them collaborating with DCNR. And so I'm, a, um, I live in Shippensburg. So, uh, the Michaud State Forest, the Pine Grove Furnace State Park, Kings Gap, all of that is right in, in my backyard. And, um, and I've been a lifelong, uh, appreciator and user of our public lands. And so I'm really mm. honored to be able to serve um, at DCNR. So thanks thanks to you all. And um, hopefully by March, I'll know what's going on. So okay. uh, yeah. Plenty of time. <laughs> what's your title now? Oh, sorry. I am, um, I'm, I, I'm filling Lauren Ingram's shoes. So I'm the direct uh, deputy secretary for uh, conservation and technical services. I oversee the Bureau of Rec and Con, um, where the C2P2 grant comes out of, and um, and the Geologic Survey as well. Thanks. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Claire. Uh, and then we'll go to the back row. Yeah, And I believe, uh, Sarah, if you can hear us on remotely, Sarah is a Conorac member. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Sorry, I couldn't be there in person. And thank you to Gretchen for all your work on the council. Uh, my name is Sarah Hall, and I'm the director of forestry for the American Forest Foundation's Family Forest Carbon Program. All right. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, so moving on to public comment, is there any comment from the public in the room or have we received any through the, I guess is it Zooms or Teams? Teams. Teams. Seeing none, we will move on to approval of the November minutes. You received these in advance of the meeting for review. <clears throat> I, just, I just noticed one thing. Was that the oh, okay. <laughs> and I think the just up top, the date wasn't changed from I think they're still reflecting September minutes because I'm like, didn't we have another meeting? <laughs> so I think it just needs to be changed to November. November. OK. Any additional changes or comments on the minutes? OK, is there a motion to approve the November minutes with that <laughs> one change? OK, second. Second. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? OK, our November minutes are approved. Thank you. I'll just give a very quick council report. Uh, we had a working meeting prior to this one uh, where we covered a lot of ground, including uh, some of the topics for future meetings and future speakers. I think we have a really good lineup uh, coming. Uh, reference that you know we'll be inviting Claire back uh, in March to talk about the C2P2 program, which as you all know, is DCNR's signature grant program for public assets. Uh, from parks and trails, land acquisition, um, and also a mechanism to support some of the statewide conservation and recreation organizations. Um, and there's some exciting work underway there around uh, equity and about uh, how to make sure that program is um, is as good as possible. I will add, because I'm always impressed by it every time I log in, the uh, technical team within BRC has done such a fantastic job on that grants portal over the years uh, that when you log into, I'll just leave it as other state agency grant portals, um, it, it really stands out as being excellent. So great job to Shane Hoover and the team at BRC who take care of that. Um, the we During that same meeting, we're going to put together a panel of grantees who have been recipients of C2P2 grants in the past so we can highlight their work, but also hear how that C2P2 funding has been important to them fulfilling their missions across Pennsylvania. Um, and looking forward to future meetings uh, in May, we're uh, considering uh, looking at DCNR sustainability 
policies and or the Bureau of Forestry strategic plan update. Um, so more to come on the specific topic for that one. And then in July, we are looking at a potential field visit to Vosburg Neck uh, State Park and the surrounding area in Tonkanic, um, one of the three new state parks that was created um, under Governor Wolf's leadership several years ago. Um, and then uh, as we spoke about as a as a working group, there's a number of other potential topics for the remainder of the year. So we'll be advertising those themes and agendas, of course, as those meetings approach. Um, we also wanted to just mention that we continue to work on filling Conrack's administrative position. Um, that that opportunity has been advertised a couple times now, and it has been a little tough to um, get a, a qualified applicant that can go through the portal and um, secure that contract. We're not giving up on that. We continue to work on it. But if you do know of anybody that would be interested in providing administrative services to Conrack and is uh, qualified to work through the state's vendor program, uh, let us know because we'd, we'd encourage that. So we'll continue to update you on that. Um, and we spent a lot of time in our working group talking about the ATV pilot report that was uh, finalized and distributed at the end of last year. This was a two year period um, of piloting ATV use on state forest lands and PennDOT roads and local roads uh, in the Potter Tioga region. Uh, we did a field visit as Conrack to the region during the right after the pilot program wrapped up in the fall of 2023. We provided some input back to Bureau of Forestry, um, just saying that there's a lot of pros to that program. There's also some cons to the program. Uh, we were really impressed with Bureau of Forestry uh, staff and the time and resources they were putting into making that pilot program work for local municipalities and for ATV riders. We talked to many businesses that had seen very significant increases um, in visitation and patronage because of ATV riders. Um, but we also saw what a strain it could be on local resources and the need for some kind of sustainable framework for the ATV program in the future. Uh, so we'll be further digesting that findings report, drafting a response that you know supports the findings, but also make some recommendations on next. <laughs> um, knowing that other members have reviewed that report, does anybody want to offer any additional comment on that before we move on? Okay, so more to come from Conrac uh, in terms of a more formal response. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Secretary Dunn for her report. Good, thank you. And uh, give me give me the hook if I'm uh, getting close to time. I want to leave plenty of time for outdoor recreation report. Um, I want to personally thank Dave Trimpey, uh, as an outgoing member of Conrack. I mean, Dave, to me, personifies um, the civic commitment of uh, you know, driving very far, bringing to the table um, a perspective informed by data and information that was uh, you know, really in, informed and educated all of us. I just think that's kind of the, the ideal model in my mind of how Conrad should function. So Dave, thank you for your commitment and time over all that period of time. It was a longstanding uh, commitment on your part and uh, you know, don't be a stranger, uh, you know, come down anytime. You can, you can be a, a voice on the um, citizen comment or you can uh, come down and visit with us and just tell Ara so she can have a lunch for you after that long trip. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, Extend the last stop. I'll stop and clap for David. Yeah. And uh, Joanne Kilgower, I don't believe is on, but again, it's Joanne's rotated off, and you know, I thank Joanne for her service on Conrack. And when she came in, she was wearing the hat of Sierra Club, a longstanding public lands advocacy group. Um, and she's now in different roles, and it really has not had to, had the time to devote to. Conrad lately, but again, thank you for thank her uh, for her public service, and of course, uh, you know, repeat my thanks to Gretchen for uh, her long-standing service uh, in in uh, Conrad and and really helping helping us really get it to where uh, where we need it to be to serve you and to serve the citizens and to be that voice that really informs us. And as we looked at it, uh, you know, we think about like you know, input, public input, the best place to 
get it is early on in policy setting and then midway in policy setting and then in response to policy. So as we uh, as we were ending uh, the Wolf administration and thinking forward, as we realized the numbers would be sticking around, we thought you know, the positioning uh, of this uh, alignment in our agency and uh, Nicole Nicole is part of the team with a lot of um, experience in external stakeholders and a lot of connection to external stakeholders and, and is in the very earliest stages of thinking about policy, you know, hearing about policy coming in from the governor's office, getting input. We thought that'd be like the perfect alignment. And uh, I think she'll be able to do this without breaking a sweat uh, in her role with We Can Serve, which used to be known as PALTA. She used to run conferences of like 800 people. So I, don't, I don't think this will be uh, too much of a stretch for her. <laughs> so we uh, appreciate her taking that on and you'll you'll meet uh, Yvette Morgan, but you'll meet Ali, another key member of her team who is heading um, our uh, Next Gen Council, which is our, our youth voices into our mission. So and Nicole with her assist and with help from Ali and Morgan will be a great, you know, great asset. I think the Conrack and will position um, things in, the, you know, up, really upstream on the policy side, which I think will be really neat. Um, so the beginning of a new year, you kind of take stock of the old year and accomplishments and you look ahead. And I'll just start by saying, you know, I, I really feel strongly that DCNR has the best uh, civ civil service team and the in, in Pennsylvania and beyond, we have you know strong uh, public service ethic and best staff in state government. So I'm really proud of that, and that's really the best asset we have to bring to our our work for all citizens of Pennsylvania. And um, that's that's you know in the accomplishments of of the staff and our teams, we just outlined in the recent resource newsletter, which I know you all get and hopefully read and. Um, Accomplishments accomplishment list was long, so <laughs> I won't promise it to be a short read. But uh, even even with that, there are things that weren't you know fully mentioned. But please uh, take the time to review that. I won't run through it um, in this in this meeting. I just trusted you to check in online and give us your thoughts on that. Because again, you know, in addition to like taking stock of where you've been, you look ahead and focus ahead and and think of what we can do better, what we can do more of. Etc. Of course, a big one um, on the governor's list is uh, launching the Office of Outdoor Recreation, um, and we announced that with the governor at, at uh, you know, along the Great Allegheny Passage. At the same time, we celebrated the additional park and forest infrastructure dollars, uh, getting the office running. And in terms of the governor's favorite saying, "GSD get stuff done," it's not, the S word changes once in a while, but. <laughs> Nathan Regner is uh, off to the races and running, and uh, you'll, you'll, I won't say much more right now because you'll get a much more rich um, report from Nathan and then later from Steve McKnight. But I really want to thank the Conrack members uh, who are really involved, you know, Silas, Bob, Marcus, who um, put a lot into GORP, you know, getting getting things launched and off the ground. So, and then the different touches we have with Conrack were obviously very helpful uh, you know, for us and Conrad's had this long-standing work with us on economics and the outdoors, recreation, et cetera. Um, for us, we're really continuing our focus on uh, three strategic priorities of uh, DCNR, uh, climate, recreation, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And it was interesting, Jerry brought uh, and showed me this really, uh, the, the National Planning Magazine, which is really the top uh, planning publication of the country and is focusing on uh, track tracking diversity, equity, inclusion, and conservation. Really understanding how public spaces are being used or, or, or not used via technology can really so going deep on the issue of like public lands and how to what it takes to be welcoming, inviting, what it takes to give people a sense of belonging is is an art and a science. It's not just a desire, which you know we have. It's not just law, which we have. Our constitution demands it in Pennsylvania, but really doing it right is um, is a science and an art. So Jerry, we'll, we promise we give this back to you, but we'll also photocopy it and and really uh, look at the look at the article in depth and see what wisdom it has to offer for DEIB work going forward. So I think that's really really appreciate that. On climate change, you know, there's a lot of a, we're a leader in climate change. The nice thing about being the largest um, public land 
manager in the Commonwealth is where uh, we have a lot of opportunity between forestation, reforestation, urban trees, riparian buffer trees, forest management, um, carbon capture and storage in our geologic survey, um, demonstration, uh, mitigation of our carbon footprint, demonstration in the public parks and state parks and forest land between solar arrays, electric vehicle charging stations, conservation to the Guaranteed Energy Savings Act. It was really the big winner for us. I mean, we're, we're putting a lot of money back into our operational dollars just to conservation measures, little little like non-sexy things like swapping out light bulbs and improving building envelopes and changing out old motors and stuff like that. But we're, we're living it, demonstrating it. And then uh, I think, you know, the the avenue ahead is how to galvanize this and really move this um, forward, engage with the nearly 40 million people that spend their time in state parks, uh, engage with local governments, and then really, really position ourselves to lead. Uh, just in, in chatting with Tom Gilbert here before the meeting, one one thing our, our climate leader, Greg Zarnecki, is really focused on is climate resiliency and landscapes. And we're in partnership with organizations like Audubon, Nature Conservancy, and a number of other partners looking at landscape resiliency, Kittatinny Ridge, and all these other big landscapes, important for migratory pathways, but also just climate resiliency from water level to mountaintop. And that's, you know, land conservation's core in our mission. So, and land management's core. And I was really um, encouraged when I was at the farm show last uh, last week, was that just last week? Um, Secretary Vilsack from USDA, head of uh, head of uh, agriculture at USDA, um, you know, Russell Redding, our Secretary of Ag, and uh, you know Governor Shapiro talking about agriculture and its its broad role in society. You know, food is logical, but the opportunity in agriculture for the things that we're just talking about, you know, climate diversity, et cetera. So I just think this whole land based movement on uh, climate is really critical. And uh, it's right right in our wheelhouse with our work on uh, forest management, with our work on land base, with our engagement with the public. So that's pretty exciting for us. Diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Again, uh, the, the wonderful thing about public lands, I've said before, that's a, really a democratizing space in our landscape in the Commonwealth. That's where people are all welcome by constitution and by law and our programming and improvements of that so that people feel access, feel welcome, and and also in, engage and mix together and see each other in a different light, you know, just understand each other as humans who are recreating and enjoying, enjoying um, you know, public land. So that's, um, you know, something we're obviously very excited in. Arlene uh, Marshall-Hawkins-Smith, our, our fairly new director of DEIB, really brings a wealth of um, knowledge to us on this on again, every everything is skills and, and techniques and education ideas. She comes in fully um, loaded with all all the skill set that will really help our agency in moving forward. And recreation, I'll give that a little less airtime because we're giving that a lot of time today on the next steps in recreation. But within the agency, again, as the state's leading recreation agency, we're launching our state outdoor recreation plan five-year plan required by state by federal government, but we we take it much more seriously than just the federal checkbox so we can get land and water conservation money. We use it um, to hear from a broad array of stakeholders and players in the recreation space, the other state agencies um, to have a play in this, like, you know, whether it's health or aging, and, and build a, uh, a, a recreation plan that really guides the future for us. And so you know, stay tuned for that. Um, Gretchen uh, is involved, uh, or really almost everybody in, in our leadership of the agency is involved in some level or another, but it's going to be pretty exciting. And uh, we'll stay in touch with Conrack on that because I think, you know, your your eyes and ears will be really helpful on that. Um, moving ahead here, so state parks, we had a big year in the state park system last year, a little higher than the year before. We had, you know, if we had these the drought, the drought situation was negative in some ways, but it led to like sunny, hot weekends for a long time. So that that always pumps the visitorship. So visitorship was high. We're at 38.5 million in 2023. Um, again, that's 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 higher than the year before. That's also higher than the pre-COVID norms. Uh, again, we don't have the mechanism to count the visitation and state forest. Uh, that we have in state parks, but um, you know, it, it was they also were enjoying um, 
um, high visitation. Three new parks were off to the races, uh, a Big Owl Creek State Park. Uh, we had a, um, a master planning meeting on, in November, attended by a lot of people. A lot of people came in concerned about particularly uh, camping. Uh, we attended a meeting uh, just a couple of weeks ago held by the local township to give local citizens a voice, heard a lot of concerns. And again, state parks are, are there for all people. We uh, we operate them for enjoyment and benefit of all citizens. But we also want to hear local voices, get their information, their ideas, history. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of folks had some concern about uh, development, concern on the environment, concern about visitors. But again, we, we run a system for all people, but we want to hear local voices. And so we've we're working on a, a task force to engage with some of the local folks, really uh, glean the information they alluded to at the, at the meeting about some of the environmental concerns there and really look at um, a plan that would make sense. We agreed to um, move camping back a bit in the, in the thinking and the planning and focus on habitat restoration, trails, and the things that are really visitor facing um, for, for more of a day visitorship in the beginning. So we'll be working forward um, in that task force on that. One action we're taking um, early on was one that we have been planning for over a year. And it's one of the biggest forest riparian buffer plantings uh, that we'll have done. What we'll be doing is 255 acres. Uh, Big Owl Creek goes right to Chesapeake Bay. And so it'll be a, a Chesapeake Bay planting to help meet our commitment there. And then a meadow restoration. Again, a lot of, if you look at Big Elk, it's really you know, beautiful grassland. However, it's this orchard grass. So it's not actually that environmentally valuable as much as it looks natural. And so we'll be doing as much as we can uh, for, you know, meadow, you know, pollinator meadow conversion and native grasses, as well as some, you know, buffer restoration in the forest. So really focused on the environmental side uh, beginning in April. Uh, Susquehanna Riverlands, um, we have an overall park master planning process moving forward down there. Again, there's been a big partnership there. The South is actually a part of this, working on that Hullum Hills landscape and the whole lower Susquehanna landscape where mosaic of uh, land has been conserved over the years and kept in uh, public use, public ownership. So the master planning process is, uh, we've got a public survey that's complete, um, working on some um, some additional areas around there and doing it in concert with the other surrounding uh, land managed by Lancaster Conservancy. Bossburg Neck, uh, working on a final scope of work and site layout to get a visitor center park office. Glad to hear you're going uh, to see Vosburg. In my opinion, the way to see Vosburg is uh, by canoe. I don't know if you can work that out, what but <laughs> that's the way to see that. that in terms of a geologic feature, that is one of the most phenomenal uh, features in the Commonwealth, this big river bend with a high cliff on one end. And so if you can pull off a, a canoe trip, that's really, I mean, that's really the asset and the way to, to really experience the bend if you can, um, if you can do that. So that's pretty exciting. Um, the ATV regional connector, I know, uh, I appreciate Conrad's focus on this and, assistance and really hearing from the public and understanding this. Um, we're uh, through the fiscal code. We have two more years on the, uh, you know, on the pilot. And we found that our, our report and review of the pilot to date, despite uh, a lot of initial concerns on our part and on citizen part, that the impact in the state forest resource is very minimal. Um, and the impact our staff was not minimal. I mean, it was you know it was a it was a big lift and a in a big uh, time issue for our staff and and you know frankly pull people away from things you know other things that you know that are part of our role. But we um, the the interest was fairly high. Uh, there were almost eleven thousand passes over the three years. You know, purchase passes and uh, riding will continue. Like I said, for the twenty four and twenty five season. And uh, I think Silas alluded to, or I alluded, I think, I think long-term, uh, I'm, I'm looking at Matt because we talked about this over the years. I mean, the long-term solution here, I think, is, a, is an authority. We, uh, we work with authorities um, at Anthracite Outdoors and Cambria County that runs Rock Run, but also the Cambria Rec Authority 
does trails and trail work like a ghost town trail. Um, Cambria is also part of a Cambria Somerset authority that operates um, essentially water s- systems like the Queen Mahoney, but within them recreation systems. And I, I was actually, um, I remember when, when one of the counties, Cambria Somerset, gave actually county money to the other county for a Cambria Somerset authority project. So that kind of collaboration between counties is possible for an authority when you have a combined goal. And I know that uh, we at DCNR have staff who have a lot of experience in working with these authorities and could help uh, assist, you know, Potter and Tioga and that next step. I think the long-term sustainability of this really rests with a regional authority and, um, you know, in a way to really have, because a lot of, a lot of them, mechanisms needed are really locally controlled things outside of DCNR's realm. I think that would be the way to really uh, make this sustainable in the long run and also give it the local control <clears throat> that it kind of demands because of the local questions on the table. Uh, timber harvest. Um, I think um, uh, I want to make a timber harvest report <laughs> for Dave because if I if I miss one when Dave's sitting here, he always points it out. So I certainly want to have a timber report in Dave's last meeting. Uh, in 2023, we produced uh, 90, 97 sustainable timber harvests, and and that created about you know 14 14,729 acres of early successional habitat, wood products into the economy, and well, it should generate 19.5 million. Uh, you know, for our revenue to the Commonwealth. So our goal, you know, we, we go in cycles and we, we all know some of the, the, the downdraft we've had in that area. So this is, I think, a pretty, you know, pretty assertive um, push, you know, in 2023. I know our staff and forestry and John Norbeck really focused on that to really try to get, get that back. Um, back up. So it, it'll meet our, our goal for the year. It's end of a 10 year harvesting plan period. So um, so for the decade, we, we met approximately 90% of our goal for the decade. So didn't, didn't quite hit it. And you know, we all know there's a lot of reasons uh, embedded in, in all that. But you know, here at the end of the decade, we really tried to pick it back up from the COVID and, and the tariff issues. Um, on the market side, um, the, the markets, as you know, have remained really, for those not in the industry, I should speak on this side, these guys know this, the markets have remained challenging. White oak is the only species that remains, you know, largely positive on the market side. Um, several new mills have popped up and buying white oak on the market. Mm-hmm. Cherry, cherry is continuing to be a challenge, but I just heard this little glimmer of hope. Um, an article I read that the whole fashion of this Ikea, like, Mm-hmm. painted stuff is shifting back <laughs> to, so that people want more heirloom and they want more natural wood that they want smaller spaces in their houses with more um you know more homey feel so the the, the trend may be swinging back around so you know maybe <laughs> so um anyway I won't, I won't let this devolve to a gripe about <laughs> people's tastes and <laughs> This is, you know, mm-hmm. you know, I just, I'll just say myself, I was thinking about redoing my kitchen. So I Googled the kind of kitchen I had in mind only to see all the articles were about how to get rid of your old oak kitchen. I was like, what? I want a new oak kitchen. I have an oak kitchen. I want a new oak kitchen. So anyway, so well, let's, let's, I'll stop with that. And um, anyway, so, so you know, we're doing our best. And I think you know, with any luck, I uh, think things will turn back uh, to the positive. I know it's something uh, we care deeply about and work with industry closely on. Um, the um, Harvard Development Council had a lively exhibit at the farm show, which our staff house with. And there certainly seems, uh, you know, seems to be a lot of positive energy around it. So yeah, anyway, we'll keep we'll keep working on that. I think I've gone pretty long here, so I think I'll end with that. And uh, open it to any questions if you'd like. Yeah, any questions for Cindy? Secretary, I appreciate you um, uh, mentioning the discussion about the the timber markets, and I, I can't not take the bait. So I, I appreciate you mentioning, and it's something that the industry has been having a lively conversation about lately: is the difficulties in the nation's largest hardwood producing state when the trend on consumer uh, furniture and goods and, and cabinetry has turned to the white painted finishes. Uh, but we are actively working towards pushing that pendulum back the other way. Uh, for those of you that might not be aware, there's a national campaign underway called the Real American Hardwood Campaign. 
and it is oriented toward exactly that. And there's some pretty exciting. Uh, it's a national national effort. Uh, Pennsylvania is very involved in that, um, but there's, uh, uh, for those of you that are familiar with the Magnolia Network, there are partners in this. Uh, Chip and Joanna Gaines are the kind of key stars uh, and, and owners of that network. Um, but the same marketing entity that did the Got Milk campaign for the dairy producers in the 1990s, Canvas United is who's doing this Real American Hardwood campaign uh, for the, the nationwide uh, industry. And so, um, I think that anyone that has had a conversation with folks that are thinking about locally sourced, locally produced, farm to table, if they want that in their food, they want that in their diet, they want that in the restaurants, then why wouldn't they want that in their home finishings as well? Right. And uh, I think that there is an opportunity to catch on to that um, that momentum and, and really work on pushing uh, kind of what's cool back towards back towards the the beautiful natural finishes um and that isn't just a consumer you know that isn't just a consumer marketing thing that isn't just something that we care about because people want to sell wood it's something that's really really important for environmental sustainability and it's something that's really really important for the management of the two million acres of dc and our land the million plus acres of of game commission lands that that uh forest management provides for for beneficial habitat. We've got the national forest in Pennsylvania as well, as well as the the, the various uh, private landowners across the state. So I think that uh, having this conversation and really saying it in, in plain terms about how important it is to to get back to that marketplace where uh, natural wood finishes are uh, are desired. I think that uh, that we'll see that if that happens in this coming decade, we're going to see that as a welcome fixture, not only on the state's forest management plan, but as we look at sustainability, carbon negative building materials, all the all the reasons why uh, we can do this a better way. Uh, pushing consumers back towards that natural wood finish is going to be a really, really beneficial thing. And, and certainly that you've got the uh, uh, the partners in the industry in Pennsylvania that are pitching in to make that happen. So thanks for bringing that up. Really appreciate it. Picturing a billboard that says got wood and there's sawdust all over a guy's face. It's it's not going down that road or <laughs> uh, yeah. we might we might yeah. you're a great guy, maybe not a market. <laughs> we do have some right. great billboards. Keep your eyes out. I think okay. uh, we'll keep it we'll keep it G rated though. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Again, I mean, it, uh, you know, if someone wants to sequester some carbon, I mean, you, know, you, can, you can sequester carbon in your house, you know? <laughs> yeah, good yeah. point. Uh, quick question for you, Secretary, on just the DCNR's workforce. I, I assume this is the time of year when you start um, looking ahead to hiring for some of your seasonal yes. employment. Just interested in if you're seeing any easing on the workforce challenges or uh, how hiring's trending. Yeah, we, we have a, a couple categories, particularly are, are difficult in state government in general. Um, one, one is law enforcement, particularly in the southeast, you know, where where I mean, townships uh, now now pay you know, good salaries for law enforcement is really hard for government to compete. So Game Commission, Fish and Boat and DCNR, uh, John Orbeck and our team have been working together on uh, Looking at and salaries and looking for a solution and working with Office of Administration on on that issue, on um, engineers, um, entity, you know, DGS, PennDOT, DCNR, DEP, uh, engineering uh, is a very competitive uh, field right now, and um, one that there's a the OA is looking at sort of an engineering study to look at. Um, in terms of our uh, seasonal workforce, we've we, um, Mike Walter. Deputy of Admins, looking at some of the issues we've heard when we've done staff engagements with our workforce on um, what what's in our realm to do to help our wage workforce uh, to engage with them. We are we we get a remarkable retention of wage workers who are top notch um, top notch and knowledgeable, et cetera, and they come back year after year. So retaining them is critical for us. Because uh, if you don't, if you if you bring new people in all the time, it's just you, you lose so much time. So we're looking at the things within our control based on conversations we've had with our wage workforce that will um, you know, solve some of the issues that they have and hopefully keep them uh, keep them employed with us. Um, the outdoor core is uh, Pennsylvania outdoor core is really proving to be a good pipeline for our workforce. You know, we've continually hired uh, young people from uh, 
you know, outdoor core crews that have uh, gotten familiar with us, know they want to work with us. It's, it's helped them hone what area they want to focus on. And, and that's an avenue um, in for us. Having said all that, um, there's still some challenges out there. On the positive side, with the improvements in OA, Office of Administration's um, you know, put, putting job jobs out there to the public, the net is being thrown wider, and we're getting big applicant pulls for a, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of like, in the past, like, you know, lists that we may not have had a lot of people on, like some of the more technical things like geology and stuff like that. This this big candidate pool has been really helpful. And I know in recreation conservation, when they when they put out a position out in the uh, Rec and Con, big, big applicant pool. So that's good. Uh, so some things are positive and some things remain a challenge and uh, working through them all with Office of Administration. Thank you. Yeah. Any other Questions or comments for Secretary Dunn? All right. Thank you, Secretary. We'll move on to Nicole's policy report. So, one, um, you mentioned the administrator uh, position, and we are trying to fill that, uh, taking a little longer than we had anticipated. Um, thanks to Morgan for taking minutes. Um, very much appreciate it. And Ali, who is on parental leave, will be uh, filling in and helping to support um, this process, which only demonstrates it takes a village to replace Gretchen. <laughs> um, so bear with us. Um, we're, we're getting up to speed, but appreciate your patience as we, we figure all of this out. And thanks to Ara, of course, because she is also the backbone of, of, of this meeting. So. Um, so I'll start out with just a few policy updates. So believe it or not, it's been three years since we've adopted the ATV trail de uh, development and management policy. Uh, so the policy does require that we review it every three years. So we are currently in that internal review process. Uh, we, I don't anticipate very broad changes. Um, honestly, the ATV pilot and the report that the Bureau of Forestry developed was very helpful. Um, in identifying, you know, how the policy has been implemented, what's happening on the ground, how that informs um, any potential changes to the policy. Um, so it's going to help improve the policy, honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I would like to invite Conrec to review the draft ATV policy, so I can certainly share that with you once we're in that place um, in, the, in the next coming months. So we'll, we can talk about that more. Um, I did want to provide just a little update on the Duke Low military operation airspace or area. So um, for those who may be new to the CONRAC conversation, this is the Maryland Air National Guard uh, coming to Pennsylvania requesting um, to utilize a portion of the uh, Pennsylvania uh, wilds um as a training area and so they wanted to establish a low military operation area to fly a10s um their a10s but also f16s flown by the dc and the maryland or the um yes dc and new jersey guards um as low as 100 feet um above ground level and so currently there is an existing airspace within this footprint uh, or a very similar footprint but the airspace begins at uh, 8,000 feet. So it's a very big difference. Uh, so they had uh, submitted their draft environmental assessment and draft draft final environmental assessment and draft final um, FONSI, finding of, finding of no significant impact. Um, this is a federal action, so it has to go through the NEPA process. And uh, they submitted those documents last year in the spring we provided substantive comments both on the first round um, and on the second round um, and have not heard anything since. So they have not finalized the FONSI um, as of yet. So we are still waiting on what that action is going to look like, um, but it's interesting because there are some articles coming out of Maryland where they are talking about the decommissioning of A-10s. Um, so the U.S. Air Force for a long time has been wanting to retire the A-10, and they finally got congressional approval to do that. And that's likely going to happen in the next four to five years. So by 2029, A-10s will no longer be flown. 
A number of the Air Guards have already um, moved to F-16s. Um, as, as, as I mentioned, New Jersey and DC, um, a few of them, three, at least three are flying F-35s, which is that really new fancy um, uh, jet airplane. Um, so that, um, but we're not sure what's gonna happen to Maryland. Uh, these articles suggest that they might be moving to cybersecurity. Um, type operations. And so I don't, we don't know what that means in terms of an air mission. Um, and that doesn't, we don't know what that means in terms of what kind of use um, they might need now that that is changing. Uh, so we have, as you know, long um, recommended that a full draft environmental impact statement be done. Mm -hmm. um, this would be important for a number of reasons. One, to do just a much more um, comprehensive analysis. Um, of the impacts, mm. but also vet alternative options. And now that we know that this is going to be a different aircraft, um, it's even more imperative. Uh, so I will keep you posted on this. That's the only update I have, um, but it's been a very interesting uh, process. And I appreciate all the work that Conrec has done on this. So thank you for that. Um, just on a few other agency updates. So as uh, I think was mentioned earlier, SCORP. So the Technical Advisory Council meeting kicks off on February 13th. Um, so Marcus will represent Conrec. He would have received an invite or will re receive an invite in the next few days. Uh, we will be um, definitely engaging Conrec. There will be opportunities for you to, to participate, to review materials, to review objectives. Um, so we'll provide updates as the process continues. Uh, we did receive federal funding to hire a SCORP specialist, and that person begins on January 29th. Uh, and simultaneously, we're also going to be kicking off the Pennsylvania Land and Water Trail Network Strategic Plan. Um, so that also will be happening. And of course, this work is led by BRC, but has been um, a very uh, collaborative process. So. And then um, we will have a presentation. The, sorry to interrupt you. Just curious about the nature of that. Is that um, similar to the plans in the past that have identified top 10 trail gaps? Or, yes. um, and I only ask because I know we've spoken a lot about trail maintenance as Conrack. Um, just curious if there's space within that plan to address issues like that or if that's sort of beyond the scope. I think that there will be. Um, so, yes, it's looking at. Um, Kind of some of those big infrastructure needs, but also understanding kind of broader, you know, some of the issues that um, relate to, you know, trail management, trail development. So I think there's some opportunity for that conversation. Um, so we will we will hear from Claire um, in March um, and some of her team members on C2P2 uh, and the amazing grant program that they manage. Uh, the program did open on February 1st and closes April 3rd. Uh, and then we also have the spring ATV snowmobile grant round, which opened on February 1st and closes on March 29th. And then just a note that the budget address will be February 6th. Uh, so that will be live cast. Uh, I can give you a link that you can share with Conrec so that you can all watch, um, make popcorn. Um, and we will have a budget recap meeting um, in March. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you, Nicole. If there's any questions. Yeah. Any questions for Nicole? All right, thanks for the thorough report and we'll turn it over to Eric. Hello, how's it going everyone? Um, just a few things from the ledge side. Uh, the House uh, budget hearing will be on February 28th at 1 p.m. and DCNAR this year gets to share the stage with uh, DEP. So we'll both be uh, testifying together uh, before the House. Uh, the Senate, they waived our hearing this year. Um, they said we always do such a good job, so clearly we, 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 they they waived our uh, our hearing this year. So that's that's good news. Um, the House is back in March 18th, and the Senate will also be back in March 18th. So it's a it's a pretty long um, window right now of uh, no session days. So March March 18th is when is when they'll be back. And I'll just note one thing. Uh, Senator Langerholk uh, just circulated a co-sponsorship memo the other day that would uh, provide a military discount for um, 
the, the military and their families on our on our state park lands. Uh, it's a I think it's going to be similar to what Rep. Armanini introduced in the House. So that's kind of floating around right now. So I'll just note that. Um, and that's it. Any questions? Uh, has the agency sort of taken a position on discount programs like that in the past? We we have a we have a few concerns, um, but we have we have draft language in case that you know we need it to, to help fix the bill. So very good. And this just hit yesterday, so I, I wouldn't expect you've seen it, but I think it's House Bill 1830 involves a snowmobile and ATV uh, youth training. Have you had the opportunity to see that at all? We, I did have a chance to look at it. Um, we're we're reviewing it right now. I know our forest staff is okay reviewing it. That's all. I thank you. <clears throat> Anything else for Eric? All right. Thank you, Eric. Um, we don't have any formal council business uh, that needs action. As I shared before, we may have our response to the ATV uh, pilot report for the next meeting. Uh, so we can move right on to our uh, two presenters, Nathan and Steve. And I believe Nathan's going to kick things off. Welcome, Nathan. <laughs> well known to many of us. <laughs> Thank you. I, t I tell you what, anybody who knows me is going to know it's it's going to be awfully hard to do this while sitting down rather than pacing the room. Um, <laughs> um, I'd like to thank you all for the opportunity to speak with you today and, and share an update about the Office of Outdoor Recreation, um, the work we've been doing and um, and the uh, the GORP report, um, which I believe you've all had an opportunity to um, at least um, at least review. Uh, so um, with those uh, very sincere thanks out of the way, I hope to talk with you, you know, on a regular basis. Um, uh, let's start off with a bit of a celebration um, with establishment of the Office of Outdoor Recreation. Please join me in congratulating you for having an office <laughs> of outdoor recreation in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We were pl very pleased um, this summer when uh, Governor Shapiro announced establishment of the office. Um, in Connellsville, Pennsylvania, along the Great Allegheny Passage, um, and this is a uh, 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 this is a headline. Oh, the the byline is cut off at the top a little bit. This is a headline out of the Pittsburgh Post Gazette, September September sixth, um, an editorial under the title of "New PA Outdoor Recreation Office is Government Done Right," um, and we agree with this. Uh, so, um, uh, established just four months ago, uh, under Governor Shapiro's leadership, we are in fact getting stuff done through the Office of Outdoor Recreation, um, in Pennsylvania. And, um, let's talk, uh, let's talk a little bit about what this office is. Um, so, uh, it is Pennsylvania's Office of Outdoor Recreation brought to you by the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Its administrative home is here with us in DCNR. Um, however, it is not exclusively an entity of DCNR. Um, it's brought to you in, con in cooperation with the Department of Community and Economic Development. They have been our strong partners and allies at every step of the road along the way until we get here. Um, and it is a collaboration among uh, or the office will collaborate then among a number of different government agencies, uh, Arts Council, P Historic and Museum Commission, Department of Health, Department of Transportation, Labor and Industry, Game Commission, Fish and Boat Commission, the list goes on. In other words, um, this office is a service brought to you, uh, brought to the Commonwealth by the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, really designed to pull together all elements, to connect the dots, if you will, among um, among agencies, uh, uh, among agencies in government. So just a brief word, I don't want to get too deep into the nuts and bolts with you on this, but a brief word um, on how the, the office will be structured moving forward. Um, the Office of Outdoor Recreation is, uh, sits in the, in the Secretary of DCNR's office, um, uh, which we think is a very advantageous position for it. Um, it, gives us, uh, uh, it gives us an ability to work both throughout DCNR and support our agency, um, but more importantly, to connect directly at the leadership level um, with other departments uh, across government. Um, the office has a director of outdoor recreation, I, I, who I've heard does a very good job. Uh, 
<laughs> and he's humble too. Uh, and um, and we're looking forward to bringing online uh, a deputy director and an outreach and engagement manager. Uh, and those are those are positions that we're working with the office of outdoor or the office of administration right now um, to define. And we look forward to um, to bringing candidates on board uh, later this spring uh, and and be up and running by early summer. So that's the um, that's the team. Now, what's the mission of this office? Well, the mission of this office is to unite, grow, and strengthen Pennsylvania's outdoor economy. So we're bringing it together, we're making it bigger, and we're making it stronger. You may ask the question, well, what what is our outdoor economy? Um, one way to think about our outdoor economy is, is, is a composite of sort of three parts, two of which generate direct value and, and, and one of which is, is really a savings component. So we have our outdoor industry um, in Pennsylvania, and I'll talk a little bit, a little bit more about that in the next slide. Um, we have uh, then the contribution that outdoor recreation and the outdoors can make to community and economic development more broadly uh, in the Commonwealth. And, and, and my colleague, Mr. McKnight, will be sharing some uh, his insights about how that can happen um, from his perspective in Blair County a little bit later. Um, and then an important part of our of our outdoor economy is also the cost savings that's brought to the Commonwealth and its and its and its residents um, through uh, green infrastructure and the cost savings that they can generate over gray infrastructure, mm -hmm. and um, and and the cost the healthcare cost savings that can be generated through greater participation in outdoor recreation and the individual and public health improvements um, that come along with that. So so our outdoor economy is not one simple thing, but it is in fact a composite. Um, of a number of different things. And uh, our outdoor sector, or our, our outdoor industry um, is itself uh, a meta industry or composite of industries. Um, so when you hear us tout the uh, major economic significance of outdoor recreation, $17 billion, that's 1.8% of Pennsylvania's gross domestic product, 164,000 jobs in the outdoor industry, that, and they exclude both proprietors and independent contractors working in the outdoor space, um, we can break down our outdoor industry into kind of three buckets. One is the stuff of outdoor recreation, um, design, manufacture, distribution, retail, and repair of clothing, equipment, vehicles. Second major bucket are our experiences, experience providers that, that are working in the outdoor sector, ski areas, mountain lodges, guides, outfitters, rental shops, event in increasing number. This is something that we talk about a lot here about at DCNR, our event and race organizers, and all of the hospitality associated with outdoor recreation, food, beverage, lodging. I can tell you stories of brewery owners who, as they expand, look only for locations along trails and along rivers, because we get thirsty when we recreate outdoors. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the vote of confidence. Um, and, and maybe the most invisible component of our outdoor industry are, are our professionals. I can tell you that in Pennsylvania, we have attorneys and accountants who specialize in servicing outdoor businesses. Oh, interesting. Yeah, we, yeah it is, isn't it? We have, we have planners and designers. We have map makers. We have guidebook writers. We have a tremendous cadre of really inspiring creative professionals, photographers, videographers, journalists, artists who specialize in the outdoors. Um, you know, I'm, I, I, I don't know what powder to keep dry, but I had the realization, we had the realization, Steve and I were sitting together at Seven Springs, and we had the realization, AccuWeather is a member of our outdoor industry. Oh, interesting. First, I'll tell you, the weather ain't indoors. But also, we know that AccuWeather provides a business-to-business -business product, providing specialty forecasts to outdoor businesses. So when we think about our outdoor industry in the Commonwealth, we really, we really ought to think broadly. And it, and it promotes other things. Like we've got 14 brew pubs in Williamsport now. Yes, uh, yeah. Come up to do the Pine Creek Trail or... So not only do we have a direct outdoor industry, but I hear our outdoor industry promotes other things. Yeah. <laughs> it is a contribution to our community economic development. And we see this, we used to call it a three-step process. We don't do that anymore because that implies that you get to step three, you congratulate yourself and you walk away. And that's not what this is about. This is more of a three-part approach or a three-slice pie. It begins with our home turf. 
conservation of natural resources, ensuring that we have high quality environments out there and development of recreational infrastructure and access in these places. Once we've got that resource component in place, then we have an outdoor economy that grows around these outdoor industry businesses um, uh, that I just talked about. We develop an outdoor workforce, and this is closely tied uh, with work our colleagues over in DCED are doing around tourism. Once we have outdoor economies developing in small towns, large cities around the Commonwealth, then we have the conditions we have we, we have improved the conditions for broad based community and economic development for making our communities uh, attractive places to live places with high quality of life in which youth want to stay in which students want to remain and when in and to which highly competitive new workers and entrepreneurs want to move and so this is this is our play um with the outdoor industry and uh, the outdoors contribution to um, economic development. So how are we going to move this, these efforts forward? Well, in the conclusions report from the Growing Outdoor Recreation for Pennsylvania process, and I'd like to take a moment just to thank everyone who contributed their ideas, their energy, into uh, this process. I've never been part of a more successful and more productive stakeholder engagement process um, than this. So those of you who are in the room and contributed to it, thank you. Um, and everybody from around the Commonwealth who, who, who threw their ideas into the hopper, uh, we couldn't have done it without you. So we've got seven priorities that we're going to be working on uh, across three areas. I'm going to I'm going to um, in a very rapid fashion go down through those and give you some four examples of some of the action items um, we're looking to pick up uh, in our first, you know, let's call it our first maybe three years or so of operation in the office phase one. So now the first thing we need to do is organize our outdoor industry. We need to do that by getting to know our outdoor businesses, uh, pulling together, pulling them together, and importantly, helping them get to know each other. Uh, we heard a lot, particularly from our guides and outfitters as we were talking around the Commonwealth, about, um, about developing one-stop resources, about helping to streamline the permitting process associated with being a guide or an outfitter and an, an event operator um, to help those businesses sort of, uh, well, to help us on the government side of things work more at the pace and in the style of those businesses. Uh, I think we need, to, we need to envision innovation strategies in outdoor recreation. What is an outdoor innovation hub for Pennsylvania? Is it advanced manufacturing of gear? Is it electrification of, of recreational vehicles? Is it, um, is it advancement of, of long-term weather modeling? It could be many of these things, but there's tremendous potential for innovation within our outdoor industry in Pennsylvania. We need to develop our workforce. Working, working with our colleague uh, uh, Morgan, the, the William and Hannah Penn Fellow right now to develop a policy review and brief uh, around workforce development in the outdoors. Um, we need to elevate the visibility of outdoor jobs. You know, this idea of like, whoa, we have attorneys focusing on outdoor recreation. Yes, we do. Um, so we need to elevate those stories and we need to diversify. Um, we need to diversify the, the types of the, 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 the types of folks who close their eyes and say, you know what, I want to develop a career in the outdoors. I see a future for my profession that connects to my passion there. Um, and, uh, and we need to, pro to provide more, we need to provide outdoor relevant training to folks who are adjacent to the outdoor industry. Uh, you know, for example, I, I think about, uh, I, I think about our, our friends and partners in conservation districts um, who help out with sediment and erosion control plans for trail planning. Um, I would love to spend some time with them talking about the specifics of different types of trails um, to, to, to make sure that, that we really are all up to speed on these things. And our conservancies, land conservancies. Yeah, ab absolutely. There are you know, few, fewer core partners on that, on that first part of the land conservation, resource conservation side of things. As we're developing our outdoor workforce, organizing our industry, communicating the value of the outdoors is going to be very important. We need success. We need packaged success stories. We need testimonials from businesses, from economic developers on the importance of this. We need advanced economic impact studies. We right now rely on the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis data, um, which I think is very good data and serves us well. Uh, but there is a larger story to tell, and many other industries are telling this larger story. And I think for us to um, 
uh, 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 to be good members of the policy discussion in the Commonwealth, we need more economic impact data. Um, and a core, a core sort of working tenant modus operandi of the Office of Outdoor Recreation is that we get around. If you want us to talk, we talk. Um, and so we're going to continue that. We're going to continue to show up in every corner of the state. We're going to continue to talk to anybody who wants to talk to us to get the message out. As we are building the capacity of our outdoor industry, we also need to um, uh, think about our community and economic development um, uh, 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 work. And a lot of this is policy and capacity oriented. So here we've got a top down and a bottom bottom up or, uh, uh, approach. The top down approach is steering from Washington, D.C. to Pennsylvania and from Harrisburg to Pennsylvania communities, steering policy and funding with downstream relevance. Um, to work on this, we're actively engaging with our national partners. There's an organization called the Confluence of States, and the Confluence of States is the national organization of state offices of outdoor recreation. Pennsylvania has been voted in as the 17th and newest member. I'll also highlight that we are the largest member by state population and state economy in that group. Um, the Confluence of States is also a conduit to the Outdoor Industry Association, the Outdoor Recreation Roundtable, um, the, the two leading national trade organizations um, that uh, that represent represent the outdoors. So by by actively participating in those national level policy conversations in Washington, D.C., um, we can not only have Pennsylvania's ideas uh, 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 a need better represented, um, but we can also be a leader. We can be a leader for Eastern states. We can be leader for industrialized states and consequently then um, help Pennsylvania become a national leader uh, in the outdoor economy movement. As we're focusing um, on the top down, we got to go to the gym on the bottom up approach. We got to bulk up our local and regional capacity to take advantage of this funding that's coming down and this policy that's coming down. An unprecedented amount of it, I'll, I'll note. Um, and here, uh, here's where I see a strong role um, for the office in collaborating with county uh, economic development organizations like, like uh, the one uh, Mr. McKnight represents, um, and particularly uh, with liaising with our local development districts and regional economic development organizations as the office has sort of studied the landscape and, and, and mapped out our strategy. Um, there are fewer more key allies than the so-called local development districts um, that we've identified. And so we want to get capacity into those organizations. We want to get close relationships with those organizations um, and, and really dovetail together. So we've talked about industry. We've talked about economy. Let's not forget about the humanity of all of this. That's really what we're in it for. While um, uh, while nine out of 10 Pennsylvanians recreate outdoors every year, not all Pennsylvanians have equal access to or feel welcome in the outdoors. Uh, and that's a problem we got to work on now and fast. The office is going to be active in that by um, uh, helping helping us in the agency and others, our partners in DCED, in the, in the commissions, uh, Department of Health, et cetera, um, develop relationships with uh, partner organizations like Outdoor Inclusion Coalition, represented uh, with Marcus Schaffner, the, uh, uh, our, our member of Comrac, um, and others through this, um, working with our, you know, an, another thing we're doing, we're working with some of our local climbing organizations um, to find find out what, what needs to adaptive climbers have uh, uh, in the Commonwealth. And, um, and we are uh, collaborating with, we're developing collaborations with other uh, equity, inclusion, belonging-based entities in state government, like the Office of Health Equity, like the Office of Environmental Justice, like the, what's Department of Transportation? Office of Transportation Equity, a new one that constantly emerging, constantly emerging. How do we bring these together? How do we get to know each other? How do we coordinate at a regional level? Um, so the office is trying to pull some of those, pull those relationships and resources together to address specific needs right now. At the same time as we're looking down the road 30 years from now, we understand that the leaders, that conservation, natural resources, outdoor recreation will need in 2050 and 2060 are beginning their careers now and do the leaders we need have the on-ramps to those careers 
to get them where, where we need to be? That's one question. We also know that major infrastructure projects, whether that be land acquisition or building of long-term tra long-distance trails, et cetera, that those are often multi-decadal efforts as well. And so I think the office is uniquely positioned to look both within um, DCNR plans and importantly across long-term plans throughout government and make sure that some of these generational initiatives are represented up front. So um, we'll be positioned where we need to be in 2050, 2060. That was, I shared with you, I don't know, 12 or 15 sort of four example actions. Um, we've got more than 30 on the list. Um, and and so, you know, we're, we're eating the elephant, but we're trying to take three bites at a time. Um, and, uh, you know, when we do that, this is when, you know, this is one of my favorite jokes to make in a presentation. When we do that, sometimes this is what the work can feel like, <laughs> but I know this is really what we're doing together. Uh, so thanks for the opportunity to share these few, um, thoughts with me while I'm happy to take, uh, to take questions right now. I, I, it might be, um, more useful to hear Mr. McKnight's, um, thoughts first and then um, together we can uh, uh, we can have a discussion. So thanks for that. Don't ever do what I just did, which is agree to speak after Nathan says all of those words. So please take this as a uh, lesson to you all. Uh, Nathan, uh, we, we love to hear Nathan uh, give this presentation and uh, for for a bunch of different reasons. I mean, Nathan's the right person at the right time, and this is the right topic at the right time for economic development. Um, and I, I'll tell you why, and I'm going to keep this, you know, really pretty simple. Uh, any, and Silas knows this, uh, any economic developer right now who's worth their salt realizes that this business is about people people attraction, people liking where they live and work and wanting to invest, you know, moving, uh, moving a person to become an investor, to become a resident and an advocate for their community, whatever that respective community is. Um, we're not chasing the big business or industry sector. And a lot of times, you know, uh, the data and, and what's needed to form a foundation for a study like this in a, in a large rollout can easily get drowned in the data, the industry sector, and how they all work together. But in the end, and we got to keep this pretty simple, uh, there's just people of all different shapes, sizes, backgrounds, um, resources that uh, participate in a community. And what's unique about Pennsylvania, and this has been one of the uh, reasons I was eager to uh, jump on, and and when we met. Nathan, I was just like, oh my God, I can't believe we're going to be doing this because I have felt for so long, I grew up in central Pennsylvania. I, I'm working in my hometown. I boomerang three times. Uh, I've lived out West. I've, I've been to New England. I'm an outdoor heavy user and, uh, and an addict. And I've thought Pennsylvania, my hometown is so rich with all of these outdoor resources, yet we're narrowly defined in, in very specifically thought of, um, at, in, in different ways, in a, in, in a too narrow way about how we use our outdoor resources and what we do. Uh, we don't know that we have a very large concentration of outdoor ski areas. One of the largest states that have, uh, ski areas, uh, in, in the United States. Uh, we have trails, we have boats, we have, we have all of these things, but yet we're not thought of as that outdoor recreation space, um, yet we are. And this is an effort, and, and what one we're, we're very excited about, and especially from an economic development standpoint, is moving it from unconscious to a conscious level. And I'll give you a very good example of, of something that happened today um, at our executive roundtable where we pulled together our uh, business leaders from uh, across uh, a bunch of industry sectors, but a lot of these were in the manufacturing space, so traditional manufacturers. And unprovoked, even though I do sometimes have to seed a conversation, in this particular case, I did not. And as we went, went around the table, uh, uh, a few of these industry folks began to share uh, a story that, about outdoor recreation and how the connection uh, was made. 
And that was that uh, we all know there's more jobs than people right now to, in a lot of locations, especially ours. Um, and we're competing for talent across the United States here in the mid-Atlantic. And uh, in recent hires, uh, a few of our local industries have have said, we've won five people that have come to work for our, our, our company. And they all cited outdoor recreation and the environment that we're in as the reason they want to live in our community. Uh, they're getting it. The businesses are getting it. Once the businesses understand the connection between the outdoor assets that we have and the way that we live in our lifestyle and culture in a mountain town, we call ourselves a mountain town because we are, um, we're going to attract people who want to live in a mountain town. They're going to come in. They're going to want to take part in these things. They're going to want to buy a house. They're going to want to spend money, send their kids to school and do all of those types of things. We are very much in a people driven economic development model now. And I do not see that changing. Um, it was amplified during the pandemic and post pandemic. We have a mobile workforce investment is moving now in areas where they want to live versus where they need to live. And it's going to be very, very important to use this study as a foundation and, and the office and, and the infrastructure that we're putting together, uh, through the lens of economic development and how we're going to grow uh, Pennsylvania, reverse the demographic trajectory that we're that we're in, especially in the middle part of the state, and we're very sensitive to that. And we know what we need to do. Uh, and, and and the language of outdoor recreation, the asset base, building that capacity that uh, Nathan said, which is something in Blair County we're very interested in doing. Um, are all the steps that we're going to be taking. And we're very much looking forward to partnering uh, with the state, not just through programs, but to have the state to have our back. You know, when we say we're going to do this and we say we're a mountain town and it's and it's reverbed by the state and a state policy and a state message, um, then it becomes real. Then it becomes something that I, people who live hundreds of miles away will consider uh, uh, moving, moving their family, moving themselves into the area and, and, and taking part in the experience. So that's that I'm learning from him. Uh, it's been a, it's been a great working relationship that's going to continue for, uh, for sure. And, uh, yeah, like Nathan said, I think we can both be open to questions and, and conversation here around this uh, point. So thank you. Thanks to both of you, and I'm sure there will be some questions. I'm just going to jump in on since Steve went second um, and ask. I know, um, and I don't know, most probably aren't aware of this, that one of your roles that you play is with our statewide Pennsylvania Economic Development Association, which is really folks like you and myself across Pennsylvania that help mm -hmm. economic development on a local level um, and the association that brings us all together. Uh, because Steve has held that role and because of some of the work that Nathan's been doing has been happening across the state, even at those economic development conferences, you hear these conversations now about mm -hmm. quality of place. Um, part of that is sort of organic and part of it is because Steve and others have pushed for, you know, speakers and panels on those topics uh, amongst economic developers. But I'm just curious in your role with PETA and, you know, your interaction with other economic development professionals, do you think folks that work in economic development corporations, chambers of commerce, uh, county economic development roles across Pennsylvania, are starting to pick up on this message and you know are sort of understanding what you just laid out for us or do you think there's still a whole lot of work to do there there's there's work to do uh but but the needle has moved tremendously and i and i do think the the experience during during the pandemic during shutdown mm -hmm. uh really put it right out in front for most folks to see how how important it was to have those outdoor assets uh it it, it um it, it just brought it to the forefront it took it from that unconscious level to more of a conscious thing and, with, and when they see people utilizing trails that were already existed and they say we need more trails uh that's exactly right we need more trails you know uh, the areas that have been doing outdoor recreation as a, as an economic engine um, um, for many, many years now, uh, 
uh, you can go to those places. You can see trailheads. It's not that easy. It's not. Um, it's very easy to access those those assets. Here, if you come to Blair County, you'll see the mountains, and you'll figure out. You know, how do I how do I get there? You know, what do I do? I uh, we're not speaking the language yet. Um, uh, I, I, I think, you know, what Nathan's point about that and educating, you know, different folks about the, um, the culture of outdoor recreation and what it means, one of the frontline uh, um, uh, businesses or individuals that I think we also need to focus on, I know in our area, are the hotel uh, staff and front staff, you know, because we want them to uh, assume that people that are coming there are are there for various outdoor recreational assets sometime in the future. When we build ours out, we have more of them. They're going to know how, how was the trail? You know, what's the weather like? You know, that, that kind of conversation that happens in those other areas can happen here uh, once things are built out and you have that communication platform happening. And I mean, this is the step, the first fundamental step to, to get to that point. Thanks. And on that point, Airbnbs. You know, we've seen up in Pine Creek Valley, a lot of the cabins now converted to Airbnbs. And uh, I also mentioned earlier the brew pubs. It just amazes me that our small city of Williamsport has 14 brew pubs. But it's because people come up, hike, kayak, bike, and then they have to have some relaxation. I, I, I like to, yeah, they call it the Statue of Liberty syndrome, but it's, you know, it's the folks that live in New York have never been to the Statue of Liberty. Um, and in our area, we have a lot of the locals that have lived there for years, but have never gone to the Lauer Trail or have never hiked or gone to Allegrippus or, you know, what what have you. But to your, to your point, you know, we have now eight breweries that um, uh, opened up over the last five years or so. And, um, when you go to those locations because of the culture of, of craft beer and, and those being destinations where people share stories and get to know each other, um, they're, they're all outdoor enthusiasts in those locations. They know it and they appreciate it. Yeah. And they look at the entire region. I guess that's one of the topics or the, uh, the title of, of the presentation I was assigned, but, um, you know, where, where we're located, we live in the regional asset base is the way we see it. From Bedford to Somerset, uh, uh, Seven Springs, Tussie Mountain, Blue Knob uh, in terms of ski areas, but Roth Rock and Allegrippus and the Ghost Town Trail and, and Raystown. I mean, all of that forms the fabric of, you know, where we are. If we go out to Summit County, Colorado, we're two and a half hours from Denver, and then you still have an hour and a half in either direction to get to wherever you want to go, and you don't even think about it. Well, people coming to our our community, they don't even think about it, but the locals do think about it. And it's, you know, so so we want to turn, you know, it's an educational process for the folks that have, are longtime residents about what we're trying to do and what that means. I'd like to briefly touch on the con on, on the topic of housing as it, as it relates to short term rentals, um, also as it relates to housing prices in general. I am I am an unapologetic booster of outdoor recreation, potentially even a zealot. But we need to acknowledge that in our, you know, in our zeal to, to leverage outdoor recreation for the benefit of everyone, we need to keep an eye on potential negative consequences. And, and one of those negative consequences that we got to be sensitive to is uh, effects on, on housing availability, housing cost, and uh, property tax cost. Um, for example, uh, uh, Outdoor Recreation Roundtable. I mentioned them earlier. One of the national uh, trade associations has out um, has out sort of a white paper around workforce development. Um, and point number four in that white paper is um, to address affordable housing issues in outdoor amenity towns. This is something we hear about uh, in central Pennsylvania. Something we hear about up in the Poconos. Something we're starting to hear about um, up in the, that sort of Pine Creek area. Um, uh, we need to well, and and so I, I suppose I will just say that um, I think one of the one of the one of the policy needs that we see as we are growing outdoor recreation is not to simply grow um, the recreational assets and the recreational use in a vacuum, but to ensure that's co that there's coordination of growth and development across all sectors. Um, uh, and, and from our perspective in the office, that means coordinating across all agencies in government, um, to make sure that 
you know, in, in one respect, as the trail is built, the brewery is opened and the Airbnb opportunities come online, but also as, as that development occurs, the essential characteristics, cultural characteristics um, of our communities in Pennsylvania um, can remain authentic. And um, we're creating opportunity for all rather than an opportunity for some and a force displacing others. And so there's, I wanted to, I wanted to share that, that sensitivity with you. In a way, picking up on that too, another partner that I think is so important is the health industry. Because if we get people out doing outdoor recreation, it improves their health. Of course, sometimes they fall and break a leg, but you could, <laughs> you, it, it gen generally it improves their health. So I think the health industry needs to be uh, a, uh, a prime partner for DCNR in outdoor recreation. Amen. And uh, just based on your last comment, Nathan, Sarah Hall, who's a member of Conrack, I don't think everybody can view her comment, but said someone who's lived in the Pocono region for the last 10 plus years, this is a very good point. So other questions or comments? I have one question, um, just back to the business side of things. Is there any... Pull it toward you. Oh, sorry. There we go. Um, is there any organization in particular, like reaching out to the local chambers as a collective body or on a statewide level to help with kind of selling them or educating them on the benefits of outdoor recreation. Is there much being done specifically in that arena or? Uh, yes. Um, the, the set of advocates for outdoor economy work that we're discussing here, um, include at the national level, like I mentioned, the, the Outdoor Industry Association Outdoor Recreation Roundtable, um, also the Confluence of States and the State Outdoor Business Alliance Network. Um, and then often at the local level or at the state level, there's a state outdoor, a state office of outdoor recreation and some sort of outdoor business alliance. Um, priority 1A identified through the Growing Outdoor Recreation for Pennsylvania process is to organize our outdoor industry. Um, and that is, uh, that is all also prior that that is in fact priority 1a of the office of outdoor recreation we are we are coming out of the gate hot and working hard on that we anticipate early in this calendar year having um, some good uh, some good and noteworthy initiatives um, that will pull together existing business advocates like the chamber like Pennsylvania Restaurant and Lodging Association Ski Area Association and others along with businesses in the economic development community um, uh, and so the short answer is yes the slightly longer answer is stay tuned <laughs> like that in TPAs and all of those that can get around the table together and yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're, would you like to be a member of my strategy team? <laughs> Thank you. Um, just curious if there's is sort of on your wish list groups that haven't been engaged yet in your oh. work that sort of are one step rem remove baby, but you want to get them engaged in this. Um, that's a good question. I th a Chamber of Commerce is one. Now, th that being said, um, we've recently, you know, the office has recently been in touch with them and and um, in those conversations have had some of these gee whiz moments of like, never realized there was manufacturing in, in outdoor recreation. 22%, I can't do the math off my head, but whatever 22% of that 17 billion is, I'll give a cookie to anybody who can do the math, um, that 22% of that 17 billion is manufacturing in the commonwealth um and so I, I think connecting with the i think connecting with the chambers um is an important next step also um you know as 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 close as we are to them um and as proud as we are of them there are many many outdoor businesses in pennsylvania that are we know are out there but we don't know and so figuring out a way, I've heard more than 7,000 outdoor businesses in Pennsylvania. Um, and so figuring out a way 
get in touch with them, be able to communicate, pull them together. Um, these these really are going to be the focus of, you know, that that's Project 2024 right there. <laughs> they got my call. Oh, <laughs> well said. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you both for for the presentations and the comments. And um, thank you. And Conrack will certainly continue to support the work. Thanks. Um, and. That's a good segue to our work group reports. Um, we can keep these relatively brief, I think, but um, but I'll just kick things off with uh, the economic contributions working group because for quite a while we've been sort of just paused uh, in terms of a working group until uh, Nathan's report was finalized and released with some of those next steps included and so now we have the opportunity as our working group to convene talk through those recommendations some i think are a really good fit for conrac or maybe some of our existing working groups and some aren't so maybe it's an opportunity to just decide which ones we want to really double down on and support as a council so we'll convene that group uh, before our next public meeting and start to dig into that report um, I know Marcus isn't here uh, for the equity opportunities for all, but wasn't sure if uh, Sarah, if you're the only member of that group, I believe that's here, unless I'm missing someone. Um, have you guys had a chance to meet or had any offline discussions? No, no updates to report. Okay, thank you. Um, and you heard, you know, throughout the meeting, several opportunities related to equity and opportunity for all that, you know, DCNR are certainly working on and Conrad can engage in. Um, so going back up to the top, Afrom, I know uh, the State Park and State Forest Infrastructure Group has had some dialogue. Um, uh, yeah, so um, the uh, infrastructure group met um, December 7th. Um, it was a virtual uh, uh, meeting. Um, uh, Geraldine, Jerry, Rocco, Dave, Silas, Marcus, and now Janet are all on it. So it's a big, it's a very big group, um, uh, but it's a it's a great group. Um, we're uh, going to uh, we discussed some of the um, issues that we have uh, with uh, park and forest infrastructure. Um, we thought a good early um, 2024 activity would be to engage Marcy Mowry and in and, and the discussion um, with DCNR and, and the team here. Um, and uh, just talking to Nicole a couple minutes ago, we'll probably get something together in the next month or two virtually. Um, and uh, this will be part of our discussion when we go to uh, Boss Burden Act. That, yeah. that was a great suggestion also. So okay. that sounds good. Uh, we would like to have some kind of Conrack conversation on the infrastructure issue, whether or not it's um, um, the backlog or the existing projects <clears throat> that are on um, track to be uh, uh, developed um, in the near future or the strategic planning of what mm -hmm. uh, could be done. Those are the two ideas that could be uh, good Conrad conversations. That's, um, that's such a great, forum for for us to use as a as an organization here um, uh, as a council and hopefully we can get something like that planned for this year yeah that's a great that's idea thanks afram over to bob for the outdoor recreation group okay we uh continue to uh meet the first wednesday of the first full week of the month before the contract, before the meeting, what well, in the month of the meeting here. So it usually takes us about 10 or 15 minutes to decide when the next meeting is going to be. <laughs> uh, once we've established that, um, we do have Zoom, we do have team meetings. Um, the last meeting uh, we had earlier this month focused largely on the uh, pilot project report and our response to it. Uh, we think that our response to the draft that we uh, had the privilege of seeing last year uh, was pretty comprehensive. Uh, we agreed earlier this morning in our meeting uh, to develop a 
recommendations letter from CONRAC, uh, which uh, we will uh, then submit as a supplement to that original draft report. Uh, Silas will, will author that. Um, we also uh, have agreed that uh, we think CONRAC could provide a valuable role in uh, getting some uh, stakeholders together um, in the realm of this authority uh, process and, uh, you know, helping as a citizens advisory council, helping to develop that up in the area where it's important right now. And uh, we've also identified, although not done a lot of work so far on uh, trail maintenance being a, a very important issue for the outdoor group. So that's kind of where we're at. And we will meet the first full, no, I won't go through that again. <laughs> so, thank you. Yeah. And it'll be the wrong day. Right. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> thank you, Bob. Uh, and then our final group, Natural Resource Protection and Sustainability. Meredith, I know been in a bit of a holding pattern for the Bureau of Forestry Strategic Plan, correct? But I don't know if there's anything else you want to. Right. We're pretty quiet right now. Uh, looking forward to the Bureau of Forestry Planning Documents and the Climate Action Plan later this year. OK, great. Uh, thank you, as always, to the work groups for your work between meetings. And now we will open it up for any additional public comment. I don't know if we've seen anything uh, come in since the beginning of the meeting. Sounds like no. Um, thank you to those who have provided input in the chat, just uh, anecdotally or jumping in with thoughts or ideas or affirmations. We appreciate that. Uh, oh, thanks to DCNR for the wonderful snowmobile experience in PA in the last week. PA had more open snowmobile trails than either Quebec or Ontario during that period. Wow. <laughs> uh, Bob's doing some fact checking. <laughs> Thank you, Randy. <laughs> okay. Well, can you see who it is? Bob, do you want to provide your what you're going to say, and we'll figure out. Were you going to comment on the snowmobiling? Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to thank Randy for his comment. Okay, uh, so that was Randy. I, I know he was in all those areas, and so it's accurate. Was it Randy that wrote that comment, though? Okay. His hand up. Looks like he's muted, though. Okay. Okay, Randy, do you want to unmute and make a comment, or did you already write your comment? Uh, that was my comment. Uh, just my applause to okay. uh, everybody in DCNR for uh, the what uh, they did to take advantage of the snow uh, last week for the uh, snowmobilers in the state. Uh, I know I was at SP Elliott State Park on Monday and I saw trucks and trailers there from uh, Ohio. So we weren't just catering to the Pennsylvania snowmobilers. So uh, great job to everybody that was part of that and thank you. That's excellent. Thank you. And we always love an opportunity to one up Ohio. So yes. we appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you, yeah, I just want to th thank you, Randy, for uh, calling that out. I believe I believe I lost one of my deputies to your endeavors up there. <laughs> so I'm feeling on Monday because <laughs> of photos I got from Mike Walls for also from SB Elliott. So yeah, we'll pass it along to the staff. We got, you know, obviously it was snowfall these days you got to take advantage and and rock it while you got it and uh i'll pass on to the governor he loves to beat ohio so i, I will <laughs> i will let him know and one other thing i got an email from bob um it's six something this morning about uh you know punxsutawney Punxsutawn phil any of you have any influence there obviously groundhog day is coming up but you know he's the main determinant of uh, winter weather in pennsylvania and Bob is taking personal responsibility to negotiate with Phil on that front. So <laughs> avenue uh, to Phil, if you don't know Phil, is to Bob. And Nathan shared before the meeting that he will be there in person. So if you need an insider to to influence the the whatever groundhog, I guess it is. Yeah. <laughs> groundhog. <laughs> yeah, just grab it, <laughs> run. <laughs> All right. Um, thanks, everybody, for a good meeting. I know our speakers have departed, but thanks again to them for some great feedback and comments. Is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? A second. 
All those in favor, say aye. We are adjourned. Thank you.